Hello students, this is Professor McCoy. Uh, this is our final lecture. It's April 25th. And so we're concluding with Ben Crump's open season, the legalized genocide of colored people. Uh, today we're gonna cover uh, chapters 10, 11, 12, and the conclusion. So criminalization and enslavement of the poor is chapter 10. Environmental Racism is chapter 11, chapter 12, A Tale of Two Americas, and the conclusion, we rise, we rise, we rise. So let's go to chapter 10, and I've provided you all with the PowerPoint. Uh, make sure you pay attention to those PowerPoints because as far as the final exam, that's, you know, it's gonna be a big source for the materials. Uh, so, it says here, um, the American penal system has emerged as a system of social control unparalleled in world history. And that's Michelle Alexander. Also pay attention, I'm providing you with some uh, educational videos that include Michelle Alexander, who wrote The New Jim Crow, and Brian Stevenson, who wrote Just Mercy. Uh, also, Just Mercy became a movie. Uh, so some assume that Modern day slavery relates solely to the prison system, but the cr criminal justice system has a way of preying on the poor. From the for-profit probation system to excessive bails to for-profit policing with its unwarranted and excessive fines, which could arguably even be called a type of economic terrorism. So that's on 185. And I know he talks on 186, he talks in the, and I referenced it in the PowerPoint about the practice of profiting from criminalization of the poor, particularly black Americans is nothing new. It goes back to the earliest days of our country and is a direct product of the need to recapture the free labor that was lost with emancipation. That's page 186. Uh, he references the 13th amendment included the prisoner labor exception clause and that's on 187. Uh, so specifically, let's see, he talks about as the Civil War, as the Civil War drew to a, a close in 1865, a constitutional amendment to abolish slavery was debated in Congress and elsewhere. The debate centered around the desire to continue to derive the benefits of free labor. Lawmakers in the Southern states, emboldened by President Andrew Johnson's amnesty, proclamation seized upon the duly convicted language and the 13th amendment known as the punishment clause or the prisoner labor exception clause. And uh, it says the negotiated compromise could have long lasting impacts on black Americans. American business could still benefit from free or cheap labor after slavery by recategorizing and re-identifying the blacks not as slaves, but as prisoners who being punished through legislation that define arbitrary behaviors as crimes can forcibly be put to work. Uh, and so I referenced that on the PowerPoint as well. And then on 188, he talks about, he references uh, uh, the, uh, well, he references the convict leasing system. And then as I referenced in the PowerPoint, it talks about black codes, which we've, we've, uh, we've seen those in the race law book. Black codes restricted blacks to certain jobs like farmers or servants and required them to sign labor contracts. If they refused or, si refused or signed and then broke the contract, they were subject to vagrancy laws and risk being arrested, fined, and forced into unpaid labor. Uh, so that's 188. And then he references on 191, Maneshi versus Pillard. It says the Supreme Court ruled in 2011 that not only are prisoners slaves of the state, but they have no civil rights when held in private for profit prison systems. And then he says, uh, let's see, I'll talk about some other stuff. On 190, he talks about how the courts refused to intervene in the new system of slavery or to find violations of African-American rights, and they continue to turn a blind eye today. The court's treatment of prisoners as property has expanded to include throwing inmates who refuse to provide labor into solitary confinement. In McKeskey versus Collins, decided in 1990, Frank McKeskey and three other inmates sought the court's intervention after being placed in administrative segregation, solitary confinement, 
for refusing to be forced into indentured servitude by prison work assignments that provided no minimum wage. So basically it's in slavery. Uh, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals affirmed the state ownership of prisoners and held that the refusal to follow the established work regime is an invitation to sanctions. And uh, later on, he talks on 191 at the bottom of the page, the incarceration rate represents the number of people in prison per 1,000 of population. As of March 2019, the incarceration rate in the United States was 698 prisoners per 100,000 U.S. residents. Although the United States is only 5% of the world's world population, it incarcerates 2.3 million people, which is 25% of the world's total prison population. This is more people than any other country in the world at a rate that is five times higher than most other nations. Private prisons are financially incentivized to push those numbers even higher for financial gain. Uh, and then he, he even talked about, it was crazy. I, I, I don't know if you guys noticed, it was like 193, the Cattle Parish, Louisiana Sheriff Steve Prattner spoke against a new state program that could release nonviolent prisoners early. Uh, in addition, to the bad ones, they're releasing some good ones. This is a sheriff saying this, that we use every day to wash cars, to change oil in our cars, to cook in the kitchen, to do all that we, uh, where we save money. So it's clear, and so then uh, Attorney Crum says, it's clear that the sheriff was concerned about losing the labor force as well as his personal gains from their labor. At the bottom of 194, he says, according to a report by the Sentencing Project, if incarceration trends continue, one of every three black males born today can expect to spend some of his life in prison for Latino males, one in six. And as I reference in the PowerPoint on 195, he says, black women are three times more likely than white women to be in jail or prison, while Latino women are 69% more likely than white women to be incarcerated. So, sure some intense uh, statistics. He says uh, at the, towards the middle of 195, from 1994 to 2000, crime fell in addition 23% with violent crime going down by almost 30% as black and brown men and women are fed into the prison industrial complex for private sector profit and economic gain. It says to the next paragraph, slavery was officially abolished in America more than 150 years ago, but the need to replace its cheap labor source and funnel finances into private for-profit prisons has given rise to an immoral system that consciously and unconsciously criminalizes and imprisons black and brown Americans. Although prisoners can no longer be bought, sold, or killed at the whim of the state, it is also unmistakably true that as punishment, prisoners can be forced to work for nothing while biased legislation makes it easier to criminalize them. So that was chapter 10, chapter 11, environmental racism. It says here, this is a quote from Danny Glover. If we talk about environment, for example, we have to talk about environmental racism, about the fact that kids in South Central Los Angeles have a third of the lung capacity of kids in Santa Monica. Uh, so that was on 197. So he also talks uh, in this chapter about uh, you'll see it in the PowerPoint. He says, environmental racism, it can be fatal or be responsible for a host of psychological and health problems. Uh, specifically, he was referencing uh, the situation in Flint, Michigan. He said, he references on uh, 199, the Flint water crisis began in 2014. The water supply, uh, uh, it, it, he talks about how the water, it, basically he says, it says the deadly Flint, Flint water crisis began in 2014 when, without warning, state and city officials switched the city's source of water to the lead-contaminated Flint River to save money. As a result, the water supply was poisoned and more than 100,000 people, mostly poor and black, 57% of the population of Flint is black, were exposed to dangerous levels of lead. Many were afflicted with rashes, hair loss, and other medical problems. The long-term effects of this health crisis still cannot be predicted. Lead exposure can cause a host of medical problems, including high blood pressure and uh, kidney damage in adults and irreversible brain and nervous system damage in young children. Uh, I, you know, I know I, I did, uh, when Ben came into town, I uh, went, we, we went over to a, a church and talked to some of the folks there 
And it, I know I went, so I went a couple times, probably I would say about two or three times I went up to Flint uh, to talk to some of the folks dealing with the water crisis. Uh, three times because we went to a person's house we had some clients that we referred over to another attorney uh, i know there were a lot of people that were dealing with the mclaren hospital that dealt with some of the struggles and uh some of the cases were not able to go anywhere because they were trying to say you know government had immunity things of that nature so it says here although on 200 although hundreds of thousands of black and brown people went to prison for selling small amounts of drugs because prosecutors and judges maintained there were poison in the community when it came to Flint, the whole community was literally poisoned. Not one official was punished. And he says, in early June 2019, Michigan Solicitor General Fajwa Humud uh, dropped all pending criminal cases over the Flint water contamination debacle. It says, Flint galvanized national public awareness of environmental racism, but it's hardly an isolated case. Flint may have become a cause celebrity due to press attention, but the likelihood that the environmental threats will be will befall low income, large minority communities is well established and widespread. The most polluted zip code in Michigan is 48217 with a population that's 84% black. Besides being home to a large community of black and brown people, this zip code is also home to an oil refinery and a coal burning power plant. Um, so it's, yeah, it's, it's messed up because it's like people, there are people in Flint that committed wrong and I mean, unless Unless the people put pressure on the government, the people are just going to get away with it. And then as far as when they reference that 48217, that resonates very strongly with me. That's where Professor Taylor um, and, and I have stayed. And so when I typically got court during the week in Detroit, we're there. And it, it, is, it is, it's not, it's messed up. You, you, you go in there, you see the plants, it's like a haze of, of pollution everywhere. Um, so 2001, page 2001, he says, numerous reports, this is the bottom, numerous reports have established that incidents like these and what have happened in Flint are common. Among the findings, black Americans have higher exposure rates than whites to 13 of 14 monitored pollutants and Latinos have higher exposure rates to 10 of the 14. Black and brown children who live in urban areas are far more likely to suffer from lead paint poisoning, more than half of all Americans who live within 1.86 miles of a toxic waste site are black or brown. It says, in fact, according to a 2014 study by three environmental groups, more than 134 million Americans live in dangerously close proximity to 3433, so 3,433 facilities that store or process hazardous chemicals. This is on page 202. The report entitled Who's in Danger? Race, Poverty, and Chemical Disasters found the residents of the zones are disproportionately Black or Latino. The percentage of Blacks living in such places is 75% higher than the U.S. as a whole. The percentage of Latinos living in such fence lines areas is 60% higher than for the U.S. as a whole. So, it's no joke. Uh, on the PowerPoint, I referenced that. And then I referenced, I said it on 202, how it says, the more melanin the population has, the less likely the cleanup process will be expeditiously begun and completed. Poor Blacks and other racialized people have less access to adequate or ample medical facilities, and they often have insufficient health care coverage or no coverage at all. That's on 202. He references on 203, he says, legal precedents leave virtually no room for lawsuits to succeed based on the obvious phenomenon of, of environmental racism. The concept of equal protection under the law seemingly would apply, but courts have ruled that anyone basing an environmental racism lawsuit on the concept would have to show the polluter intended to harm people of color, a virtually insurmountable hurdle dumps, power plants, and heavily industrial, heavy industrial sites that spew toxins damaging to the environment and human health get located where land is cheap. African Americans are more likely to live in poverty and therefore in parts of town where land is cheaper. So as the argument goes, black and brown people find themselves in environmentally dangerous locations, not due to an act of deliberate racism, but as an economic reality.
And then he further talks about, uh, let's see. He talks about some efforts that were done uh, under Pl President Clinton on 20, page 208. Legislatures became more active than usual in the wake of the findings and that heightened activity prompted President Bill Clinton in February 1994 to issue executive order number 12898. It required all federal agencies to consider issues of environmental justice before taking relevant administrative actions. More precisely, the order directed federal agencies to identify and address in their programs the trend of disproportionately adverse environmental health effects on more minority and low income communities. For its part, the EPA issued its environmental justice strategy in April two, in 1995. The directive imposed a duty on the EPA to consider environmental racism issues as it undertook its own administrative actions. As, as the memo accompanying Clinton's executive order made clear, existing civil rights and environmental statutes were supposed to be the devices of enforcement. He, he has a critique here. He says the problem with Clinton's executive order was that it imposed no legal duty. The commands were merely aspirational and lacked an enforcement mechanism, which meant that administrative agencies could all, would, would all most likely continue business as usual without making the necessary adjustments to address the uneven distribution of environmental burdens. He also says here, uh, you know, he just talks about some of the difficulties that how it says, um, True, it's the purpose the EPA did attempt to follow through when in 1998 it issued the interim guidance for investigating Title uh, Five. Oh no, yeah, Title. No, that's Title Six. Administrative complaints challenging permit. The procedural step-by-step -step program was created in response to the Civil Rights Act's lack of provision for citizens to adequately fight environmental racism. It says since private plaintiffs had no authority to end federal funding, much less bring a civil lawsuit, the burden fell on the EPA to develop a process to investigate and arbitrate complaints when companies ran afoul of the rules. He further goes on on page 210, he says, at the time the UCC studies were conducted, the marquee statistic was that three of every five Black and Latino Americans live in communities nearly uncontrolled toxic waste sites, exposing more than 15 million Blacks and 8 million Latinos to serious health consequences. Uh, you know, again, that's very relevant in light of what's happening right now. You're having in Wayne County, Washtenaw County, Oakland County, disproportionate numbers of black folk that are being affected by the virus um, because, you know, underlying health issues, heart issues, diabetes, uh, disproportionate number of us that have asthma, things of that nature. I know in my family, we have a lot of people that have asthma. So it says here, uh, he says, although EPA's analysis of Superfund sites clearly document, documents the practice of dumping deadly toxins near black neighborhoods, the practice continues to this day. And then at the, the end of this chapter, he says, ending environmental racism is just as critical to ending the legalization of genocide as checking police brutality and protecting voting rights to impact legislation. So that's chapter 11. We move on to chapter 12, The Tale of Two Americas. We refuse to believe that the bank of justice is bankrupt. We refuse to believe that there are insufficient funds in the great bulks of opportunity of this nation. Dr. Martin Luther King. So in this situation, he references this experience as a um, the experience of Chandra Ellington, who was a 36-year-old African-American mother of four who was charged with fraud after filing bogus tax returns. Basically, uh, and he juxtaposes that with corporate America, with some of the crimes committed by corporate America. Uh, he talks about the disparity. Let's see. He talks about what happened with Countrywide on 214 and, you know, subsequently became Bank of America. So he talks about corporate America is able to get away with fraud. You know, they get charged, but then he talks about how they, the jury found Bank of America guilty um, for fraud and uh, ordered them to pay $1.27 billion to the government, but then the judgment didn't last. An appeal of court overturned the 1.27 billion award on the bizarre legal theory that Countrywide 
hadn't originally intended to commit fraud. Uh, so then you have, you juxtapose it with, he talks about on 215. So after committing a massive scam that cost Americans their homes, a large corporation gets a financial slap on the wrist. Meanwhile, poor black woman convicted of a first time offense of defrauding the government of 60,000 is jailed and she's subsequently murdered behind bars, leaving her children without a mother. So he talks about that on 2011 to 215. He also references on 219, he talks about redlining and the black, how black inner city communities and their residents were and are denied um, banking and insurance services. That's on, let's see, let's go to 219. He also talks about some of the successful cities, you know, Tulsa, Oklahoma, how blacks were doing well and how there was some kind of dispute about it and an allegation about some inappropriate situation with a white woman and how the, the, it turns into a massacre of black folk. And uh, he talked about how on 218 at the time, a, a dollar spent in Greenwood. He talks about some other cities that were successful. Uh, and he talks about... Um, yeah, the Greenhood Wood neighborhood, uh, which uh, which was a neighborhood of Tulsa, how it was so economically successful. It was called the Black Wall Street. The bustling town saw a proliferation of Black-owned businesses, bank shops, restaurants, theaters, hotels, mom and pop shops. Tulsa population grew from just over eighteen thousand to nineteen ten to almost a hundred thousand by nineteen twenty. Its residents included three millionaires. And many families had annual incomes in the six figures. Many families owned their own homes and cars, and six black families families owned their own planes. Astonishingly, when we consider it was the 1900s, he said at the time a dollar spent in Greenwood circulated 36 to 100 times before it left the community. Today, a dollar circulates through a black community for only about six hours before it leaves. And it said, you know, he just talks about a lot of things that happened with 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 Greenwood. Residents of Greenwood prospered and enjoyed luxuries and conveniences like indoor plumbing and superior schools that white residents in neighboring towns did not have. And what happened to Black Wall Street? It was wiped out during a two-day massacre in 1921. On May 31st, the Tulsa Tribune reported that a black man, Dick Rowland, attempted to rape a white woman, Sarah Page. Accounts vary on what happened between Page and Rowland in the elevator of the Drexel building. Yet as a result of the Tulsa Tribune's racially inflammatory report, black and white armed mobs arrived at the courthouse. Scuffles broke out and shots were fired. Since the blacks were outnumbered, they headed back to Greenwood, but the enraged whites were not far behind, looting and burning businesses and homes along the way. Hundreds of black people were killed and 10,000 were left homeless as the town was burned to the ground. One white person was killed. 40 square blocks that housed schools, hospitals, churches, homes, and 150 businesses billowing um, black smoke could be seen for miles in the surrounding areas. The countless families who lost their homes and businesses never received reparations and their wealth building opportunities in Greenwood would not occur in any black community ever again. So, it, you know, it's just, it's a hot mess. It's just, it's an unfortunate situation. He also talks about it, that there was examples of kinds of violence and destruction that occurred in Tulsa can be found in incidents in Ocean, Florida, St. Louis, Missouri, Rosewood, Florida. There's a movie about Rosewood. Uh, I've seen that. Camilla, Georgia and Ellsworth, California where the water was poisoned in 1810. Uh, and that's where he more specifically talks about the redlining. Uh, he says, uh, Let's see. One of the most common forms of financial discrimination is the practice known as redlining. Through this process, black inner city communities, and this is in the PowerPoint, I just read this earlier. Black inner city communities and the residents were and are denied banking and insurance services. The term redlining introduced in the late 1960s by sociologist John McKnight refers to the metaphorical and sometimes actual drawing of a red line on a map to show where banks would not make loans. Of course, these red lines almost most frequently were black inner city communities. A Pulitzer Prize winning series of articles by investigative reporter Bill Dedman 
of the Atlanta Journal and Constitution showed in 1988 that banks would often lend to lower income whites, but not to middle or upper income blacks. So that's what he talks about on 220. He also references reverse redlining on 221. It also can be an issue for minorities. That is the process of targeting minorities, not to deny them access to financial options, but to offer them loans and other financial instruments at a disproportionately high rate interest rates. This predatory lending practice often infects auto loans and, and other consumer loans. Um, and at the bottom of 222, he says, repossession and foreclosure benefit banks and place new burdens on the backs of the oppressed. When big banks or Wall Street tycoons engage in unethical behavior, even to the extent of crippling national financial markets, they are given a slap on the wrist if punished at all. But when minority groups are targeted and indebted, they are dragged through the embarrassment of having their assets stripped from them and in many cases forced to go through costly bankruptcy proceedings. On that note, I mean, our, my group, uh, Black Women Lawyers, we're actually, this week, upcoming week, we're gonna be doing a series. I'll send you guys the schedule if you wanna join in. It's free, um, it's called Ask a Lawyer. We're gonna have different lawyers talking about different areas of the law, uh, one of which is bankruptcy. I very much strongly say we need to have somebody come and talk about bankruptcy. I'm going to be talking about criminal defense and education law. You know, as I, as you know, I've said it before, I do criminal defense. I do family law moderation. I just got a new case, but family law, criminal defense, educational advocacy. Uh, but with these times, you know, people are going to need support. I mean, people, we have one lawyer that's going to talk about how people can apply for unemployment how to apply for small business loans, because I don't know if you've been following the news, there are people that have uh, applied for the small business loans and the loans went like that. You know, there's been this issue about are the loans, there's this concern that the loans are haven't been getting to the little guy. And um, so it's just, it's just a hot mess. Hopefully this new package that the Congress just approved and was signed, you know, we'll get, the monies will get to the little guy. Uh, so it says on 223, uh, racist intent in financial structures and policies affect the financial independence and access of minorities. Redlining segregated people for years after segregation was outlawed. Just as racist legislative intent in criminal laws allows for kidnapping, the criminal racist financial policies determine who will have the money and who won't. What good would it do to allow those whom society has criminalized to retain wealth? It serves no poor purpose, so the answer is to not deny them access to financial security. So, uh, yeah, he so he basically he concludes this chapter by saying, where does that leave black and brown communities on the streets where people become destitute, disenfranchised, or as we've seen all too often, the visit the victims of target practice in a trend that amounts to legalized genocide. So that's that's that chapter. Uh, he does, when we look at the conclusion, I thought the conclusion was pretty good. He, it's we rise, we rise, we rise. To protest against injustice is the foundation for all our American society. Thurgood Marshall, uh, it says on 227, as Frederick Douglass taught us, without struggle, there can be no progress. And uh, the he says the artillery that we must employ for this war must be weapons of knowledge. Knowledge is power. I'm always saying that when I'm doing my educational piece. I always say that for my because you know there's scripture that talks about my people lack perish for lack of knowledge. So knowledge is essential. The more knowledge you have, you can liberate yourself. I know my parents they didn't have any money, and uh, they my mom she went and became went in the Air Force and used the GI Bill. She became a nurse and she used education to help uh, liberate herself. My dad, he used education to, to become, you know, to go on to college, law school, and have his own law firm. So I, 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 I believe it. Education is knowledge is power. Uh, so it says, he says here on 229, we'll not end the open season on black and brown people until we shine the light on it. Uh, and then he also says, um, he was talking about some things that, uh, let's see how John Legend was getting was using his Twitter account to be a be a part of the, the bring attention to the prosecution of children as adults and criminal courts. His tweet was simple and straightforward when he wrote at the age of 16, 
shouldn't kids be treated as kids? Not according to our criminal justice system. Hashtag New York, call your senator. And I would say for for those of you here that are concerned about that, same thing. Call our, we got some elections coming up. We got people running for prosecutor in Washtenaw County, Wayne County, Macomb County. We have people running for a state senate. You have people running for judge. So that should be, if for those of you who are inclined, that should be, you know, you can try to see who are the more, more progressive ones or, or ask the candidates when they're sending you messages, what are you doing about criminal justice reform? What are you doing about these issues? Criminal justice reform, education, housing, employment, health care, as it relates to the black community, uh, to people who are poor, to people, to black and brown people and poor. What, you know, what are you guys going to do for the little guys? Not just about corporate America and, and enriching um, the big guy. It's about helping everybody, helping the little people, women, you know, too. So he talks in this conclusion about how uh, he says, first, admit the problem, call out injustice, hold the powerful accountable, share information, change the focus from criminal justice reform to criminal justice transformed, see that our communities are represented in the structures governing them, rethink incarceration, change the mission of policing, amend stand your ground, end voter suppression, end environmental racism, make access to critical financial support a priority. And uh, he, he ends it, he says, truth is light, truth is knowledge. We must speak truth to power. America, we rise, we rise, we rise. So, uh, so that's Ben Crump's open season. I hope you enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. Um, yeah, I sent you guys some videos to to watch. It's some where you could uh, a TED, TED talks from Michelle Alexander, who wrote the New Jim Crow, and Brian Stevenson, who all you know they all share this vision about criminal justice reform of, of what can be done. Uh, so, uh, this book, it's, it's been great. And, you know, we've had it with, with our other book, with the, the race law book. I think it, that the two books are very good compliments to each other. Uh, so it's been a pleasure teaching you and, you know, I'll be getting you that final exam. I'll be grading your essays and then grading the participation grades. And let me know if you have any questions. Uh, let me know if you want to know about any kind of, um, I have been getting some messages about, you know, if you want me to look into any kind of online internship opportunities for you, uh, you know, just let me know. Um, yeah, I've had some, some friends and family that have been struggling. I have an uncle right now that's in the hospital. So we've been holding him up in prayer. I have my friend, she's actually, uh, well, one of my, um, it's my mentees, her niece is is having some struggles. And so she's got to go down to Florida to help her. So we're holding her up in prayer. So we've been praying and, um, you know, if you want to keep up with what I'm doing, I'm on, after this is done, you can follow me. I'm on um, Instagram, Twitter. I'm working on Twitter. I mean, I'm working on it. I'm Facebook. I'm more active. So I'm getting there. You know, I'm trying to keep up with y'all young, younger folk your younger minded folk with the technology. So uh, everybody be blessed, stay safe. Let me know if you need anything. Um, also, you know, uh, well, I have a firm, you know, I have a law office that's over, um, we're in Ann Arbor. So um, I haven't really been over there because I've only go there a little bit, but I mean, when things get better, I'm there. So if you ever just call me or just show up, um, I mean, I may be in court, so it's better if you text me, if you want to come by and visit or you need anything, just let me know. Okay. You all be blessed and I'll talk to you later.